discuss a number of issues and, and basically to be able to close the year um, from our point of view in the opposition in Parliament. So I'm very pleased to hand over to Dr. Jack Dill and we will do the normal thing as we do at all press conferences. Uh, the, Dr. Jack Dill will speak and then afterwards we'll open the floor for questions. Well, thank you, Gail. Um, allow me to also thank you for coming to this press conference on the last day of the year. Um, I know it is a very busy time for most people. Um, so first of all, allow me to wish you um, all the best for the new year. And since by the time the, the reports about this press conference would be made, it will be the new year, may I also um, use the opportunity to wish all Guyanese, um, a prosperous new year, a new year filled with good health and happiness, and with the hope that our country will do better in the new year. Now, most of you would recognize that 2015 has been a watershed year and a very challenging year for the People's Progressive Party. We've been in power for 23 years, and we lost office in 2015 for several reasons. But one of those um, very troubling reasons is the lack of transparency and manipulation surrounding the 2015 elections. Today, I do not plan to dwell much on that because a lot of our concerns have been expressed in the petition before the court, and that matter is now sub judice. Nevertheless, to say that we are using this period in opposition um, in a manner that will strengthen the party and prepare a new set of leaders for the future. And we take our role in opposition seriously. We want to thank all of the people who voted for us, and we pledge to defend them and all other Guyanese, because we are the opposition, not just for our supporters, but for all Guyanese. Um, we will champion their cause in Parliament, to ensure that they, they continue to enjoy a better life in, in Guyana. Now, we have had a new government in place for several months, and there are a mixed assessment of this government from depending on which side of the fence you sit. Um, our own view is that there are certain emerging tendencies about the new government that are very worrying. And today, I do not want to get into all the details of normal press conferences that we have, because it's the last day of the year, and I do not want to end the year on that sort of note. Um, I just want to to identify what we see as a few very, very worrying signs of the future emerging from this government. And um, because of these worrying signs, uh, we, we have huge misgivings about what could take place in 2016, whether 2016 will be a better year for Guyana, but I'd leave the country to decide. So the first um, issue that we have seen with this government is that contrary to all of the lofty statements that is, it has made when in opposition about transparency and good governance, that this government has a, a serious, serious proclivity to do its business in the dark. 
that it lacks transparency. There are several issues that will support this contention. The first has to do with the wages and sal salaries increase that the cabinet ministers took for themselves. They, when the story was revealed in one newspaper, they denied it. Then subsequently, they came back and said they were only studying it. Then they did it secretly. And uh, then the, the country was told that you just have to trust us. Secondly, a per diem policy change that has been reported on very, very sparsely in our country. But on the 6th of June, they changed a 23 years old per diem policy by increasing the allowances in a huge fashion that ministers enjoy when they travel now and have put unlimited amount of expenses for the prime minister and the president and their spouses now, which was never the case in the past. We have seen cases where thousands or not thousands, but hundreds of people are recruited and placed on the government's payroll without any regard for public advertisement. They hold um, important civil service posts and public service posts. We have seen the recruitment of the 35 phantom advisors abroad without the country knowing anything about it. We have seen uh, this government, after condemning the tender process that was used for the specialty hospital, move, justify the award of the contract through the same process and, and lied about it, about the evaluation report when questioned and have basically said when questioned about it, we did it, so what? That's the attitude of the government. We've seen in Parliament the numerous attempts to move away, not attempts, but instances where they have moved away from parliamentary practice and from what is considered gov good governance. They just suspend the standing orders, go through three sittings of the bill in a single session. The Minister uh, of Legal Affairs has redefined uh, consultations in this country. Just sending an email to, to to some organization and deeming it consultations. We have seen just yesterday in Parliament a matter so critical um, to this country and to the world to fight terrorism, you know, something that we're all united in. That e every one of our speakers said we support the global fight and local fight against terrorism. We're all unified on that. But we do not, there is no urgency to pass a, a, a bill on the last day of the year. If we had two weeks of intense work more, we could have found the right balance between civil liberties, human rights, and a strong capability to fight terrorism. But there were, they invented the urgency clause, falsely so, an urgency. And, uh, and push the bill through the par parliament, which led to our abstention from, from the bill. So I just gave you a few instances to support our contention that this government lacks transparency. It has moved away from all that it preached to this nation prior to the elections. The second thing that we've noticed about the government broad tendency is that they have no intention of fulfilling their manifesto promises. And what they're busily engaged in doing um, is redefining the promises, making excuses for not meeting them or fulfilling them, 
And then when the excuses run out, they blame the pe People's Progressive Party. Um, so manifesto promises around the reduction of the VAT, the doubling of the old age pension, the 20% increase for sugar workers, um, well, public service workers, other promises they made on the campaign trail to the rice farmers, to sugar workers, to miners, um, to, to these have all now disappeared in the wash. So we have seen this as a new tendency developing, not just to move away from the promises, but to blame the PPP for their non-fulfillment. We have seen the, you, the, them using liberally the resources of the state to support commissions of inquiry that we believe have preconceived notions and these COIs are just um, to, to support the preconceived notions about the uh, a particular area. Let me give an example. The Gaisuko report was tabled yesterday. We do not know how much money was spent, but a, a, a conservative estimate has put this at, at $52 million being spent on that commission of inquiry. The members who sat on the commission of inquiry, there was no consultation, broad-based consultation, about who the members would be. Prior to the commission of inquiry being launched, the chairman of the commission of the inquiry of the commission no, COI said he believed that the best route for Gaisuko would be privatization. And basically, members of that COI said they have to contain costs. Yesterday, I was not surprised when I saw the, the three reports tabled in Parliament. And guess what the recommendations were? One, we should privatize. And two, until we privatize, let's cut costs. These were the positions of the people, some of the people who sat on the commission of inquiry before they even heard a single testimony, before they, they went through a single document, they already had a preconceived notion. And what we are disappointed about is that the minister would use a, a, a section in the, in the parliament, mm -hmm. statement by ministers, to give a long dissertation, including what is being said, etc., disparaging remarks, etc., when about the about the COI and about Gau and about the sugar workers and about the former government and competence of different people, including staff of of Gaisuko, when he knows that that part of the agenda should be short policy statements made by the minister because we don't have a right of reply. So because we did not have a right of reply through because, um, yesterday, we plan to have a motion be placed in parliament to have the CIY report on Gaisuko fully debated. We want a full-fledged debate on the Commission of Inquiry report. But we have seen at this tendency, again, that the government tends to use Commission of Inquiry to support preconceived ideas. They are using forensic audits to do the same thing. So let's, talk, uh, let's examine the NISIL. NISIL's the audit, the audit report, the so-called forensic audit report, which is now called an internal audit in the response by the minister to the question that we placed in parliament about this forensic audit. 
he said, the minister responded in writing that these are internal audits. So we are happy that they have moved from forensic audit now to internal audits, and we're spending $150 million to do internal audits. Because once they have moved to internal audits, then all of these audits now are subject to the Public Accounts Committee and to the par Parliament. Because if it was a forensic audit, which is designed to prosecute, then the forensic audit will go directly to the police. A forensic audit is designed to find evidence for prosecution. An internal audit is to look at processes within the agency and uh, whether there is transparency, etc. So since he has changed that definition, this will now be subjected to a parliamentary process. And we plan to have a vigorous and a rigorous scrutiny of all of those hitherto forensic, now internal audits. But that report, in a very unprofessional matter, manner, was leaked to the newspapers before it was given to the staff of Nissel to respond to the final report. And they, I had urged that the government release the report and the response to the report. Until now, I have not seen the newspapers, the same newspapers that serialized the internal audit, serializing the response to those audits, to the, each point where issues were made. And if they do that, if the newspapers are fair and they, they take the allegations of the audit and see the response, they would see how mediocre the audit is how mediocre it is. But I do hope that the newspapers will do that too, serialize the response of the staff. But I don't think the audit is about prosecution. It is about destroying repetition. Brassington's repetition must be destroyed because we were told before the elections that he, he was corrupt. And a daily push by the Kaichur News to have action taken by Brassington uh, with the head of the SARU it, who should be professional air almost on a weekly basis speaking about who should long before people are investigated or taken to the courts uh, who should who should be going to jail totally unprofessional but there are reasons for this the political reasons, and secondly, secondly, that I think the Kaichur News has a beef with Brassington because its owner, we know that he was a member of the board of Ghana Stores, and he is possibly part owner of Ghana Stores. And since the Ghana, Nissel took Ghana Stores to court for not paying the almost half of the privatization proceeds. They now probably owe the government about a billion dollars. Since then, Brassington became the target because he, unfortunately, is the head of Nissel and had to file an action against, against Ghana stores and some others, and some others. So he became very unpopular and the subject of uh, attack. I've seen Soku now being used far away. Soku was set up to fight organized crime, money laundering, etc. Soku seems is taking direction from this Saru, which is illegal, has no legal standing, absolutely no legal standing. And I, I want to urge the professionals in Soku not to take political directions or else it will destroy the credibility of Soku itself. And that seems to be, the government seems to be on a path to destroying repetition. So 
it is about we've seen several tendencies a lack of transparency tendency to break promises and make excuses using COIs to uh, settle preconceive or to support see uh, preconceive notions about corruption and about policy like guys in Guy Sukos case um, and then the most worrying of all we have seen a lack of direction in this government we were told before the elections that the government had a dedicated plan economic plan to take people out of poverty make Guyana a wealthy country and secondly that there were scores of investors lining up to come to Guyana and once the day after you have the change in government you will have all of these investors coming in they were just waiting they could not come here on the the corrupt PPP government so until today we're yet to see an economic a coherent economic plan announced to the country we have sought in our letter to to the minister of finance to get even the sectoral strategies they are non-existent not ju not just a uh, not a combined economic plan not a macro plan but even sectoral strategies are, are absent we we are yet to see the major um, investors who will come to this country and produce the growth that we are we are hearing about 10 percent growth etc in fact we're going in the other direction and almost every benefit that has flowed to the Treasury since this government got into office came from investors and investments that were made under the PPP we're yet to see a coherent climate strategy and a, a plan a low carbon development plan so total well total absence of plans that the country can start discussing about the future and that is why I say this government has no direction in the particularly in the economic field they're busy planning activities yes every day you see ministers cutting ribbons and um, of projects under the PP or talking about celebrating independence or the arch or cleaning up the city which is a good thing to do but where are the plans for the future no plan for the future we have also seen in the same economic area mixed signals being sent so different parts of the government saying different thing I, I couldn't help but respond to to this stuff about the Amila, the latest um, episode in this saga about Amila. So we heard it's criminal um, after the elections. We asked one question if it costs 2.6 billion or 2 billion to general, which we think 2 billion to buy power for 20 years, what it, will it cost the government to generate it? No answer so far. Then Norway said to the government you can't make a political determination to kill kill the Amila fall it can't be a political determination it has to be a fact-based um, determination so the government reversed a little bit and then said we are going it's still back it's it's back on the cards in the meantime they had lied about the IDB saying that the project is not feasible when we meet in the new year I will give you the mandate letter that the IDB signed with the project developer now if the IDB is saying it's not feasible then it and it signed a man, mandate letter with the project developer 
then the entire leadership of the IDB should be fired. But I don't think the IDB said that to the government because they, they, this is a major institution. It doesn't whisper to the government. It writes a letter. They are yet to reveal whether such a letter was there. So we thought after the meeting that Trotman had in Paris that they would, uh, they would basically have this fact-based assessment, that's what we are calling for, where you bring everybody around the table and you go through the issue point by point and the media would be there. That now I saw the Minister of Public Works saying it's too costly and that if there is a private interest um, then it's fine, but it's too costly. But this is a private sector project that the entire spending of the government will be limited, including the $80 million that we are we are getting as a grant from Norway, basically from our own money that we earn, $80 million. We maximum we will spend will be $165 million, inclusive of that grant that we are getting from Norway, inclusive of the grant. So less than $100 million. What this will do, this will trigger an $850 million US dollars investment. The rest of the money comes from the private sector. The 600, the 700 odd million dollars will come from the private sector, not from government. And they sell power to us at half the price that it costs us to generate the power. Now, you can't have too much tomorrow or moko moko as base load stations. I said to the minister, I saw him in parliament yesterday, and I said Mokomoko cost us $3 million to do half a megawatt of power. That's about $6 million for one megawatt of install capacity. If a miler is about $3 million, less than $3 million per megawatt of install capacity. And they can't be base load station. That's half a megawatt. It's not even connected to the grid. You can't have solar as base load. You can't have the wind now as base load. They keep talking. Tumatumari is too small and it's not going to be connected to our grid. You have the only renewable source of energy that could become a base load for, for GPL is a hydropower and a, a major hydro. And this one is far advanced. Yet we've seen the whole reverse. And what I just use this to say the confusion in the government. First, it's criminal from finance. Then, Trotman, then finance saying we're going to assess it back. Then Trotman saying something else. And now we have the latest, latest episode from, from the Minister of Public Works. And, and this is a project that can transform Guyana. If after eight months in office, this government can't have clarity around numbers just numbers, then what are, what are we to expect in the future? And so these are some of the tendencies that we have seen. The tendency is to be very vindictive, to, be, to, to suppress any dissent or any other view in parliament. Lack, it lacks transparency, the tendency to be no, tr not transparent, breaking of promises, the political motives trump now anything else. These are things that we've seen. Now, what, what can you expect in the new year from the PVP? I just, I'll just go through quickly some of the things that we will do. Um, we will push vigorously for the restoration of all the benefits that were cut from people. We want the grant to school kids um, reintroduced in the budget. We want the old age pension, the water subsidy and the electricity subsidy reintroduced, reversed, the, the removal reversed. We want, we, we're going to support the government in reducing the VAT that it promised. 
We're going to support the government in, in implementing all of its manifesto promises. We want to see the substantial benefits to the, to the rice industry. We have given a nine-point plan. They themselves said they will support the rice industry prior to the elections. We want to see that help manifested in the budget. We'll push for it. We'll push for help for the gold miners. And we will push for help for the sugar workers too. We are vigorously opposed any plan to dismantle Gaisuko. We will push again in the new year for fact-based assessments on projects, not political-based assessment on projects, Be so that so that the country will not suffer because of political decisions in the economic sphere. We will expose the government where there are expo excesses everywhere. We are already seeing some worrying tendencies about not tendering for contracts, single sourcing of contracts in a, in a scale that's unbelievable. In the new year, we'll talk a bit more about those issues, about the tendering process of this government and the composition of the tender boards that they're putting in place and how some contractors who have never turned a spade before, who have never had any experience, when experience is a critical element of contract, are getting huge contracts, not even small ones, huge contracts. I can understand incubating new contractors, starting them off small projects, etc. That's fine, fine. I think we should do that as a country, and then they grow. But people who have never, who are, yesterday have become contractors, from May 11 became contractors, now are getting huge contracts. We will, we will continue to defend people against political discrimination and ethnic discrimination. We'll continue to defend them vigorously in those areas. We will push for reforms at GCOM, some of those issues I've spoken about before, and I will not speak about those again. And then we'll work very hard to strengthen our party, as I said before, on the ground, going back house to house to, to people right across this country and re rebuilding a connection be between them and the party. And to, we are working vigorously to incubate a new generation of leaders um, in the PPP and people who will, can take this country forward. So thank you very much, and once again, a happy new year. Thank you very much. The floor is now open. Pushpa, if everyone is normal, introduce your name and your agency, please. Uh, Pushpa Bhagavan Sabatu. I just wanted to, um, I know that you said that next year you hope to do a motion to have a CY report on sugar rights yeah, sure. debated in, in Parliament. I just want to know quickly what your, what the party's take is as of right now with the findings, and then I have a follow up to that after. Okay, um, I just looked at the scan, the, re the reports that were tabled in Parliament, and I, I saw these two issues, the two recommendations that I spoke of, because that's the essence of the report. It's containing costs now until Kaisuko could be privatized. And we have argued that these matters need to be approached very carefully. Containing costs for them means that sugar workers, it seems as though that sugar workers should receive no salary increase. That we cannot accept that as a method of cost containment, that no increase for sugar workers, salary increase, or the API, which they earned as an incentive they can't, they can't even receive. 
uh, especially in light when you of the fact that you're boasting about how well they did this year. So we will never accept cost containment, um, which will penalize workers and in, in this manner, in this manner. I can understand if you argue we can't afford if the union asks for 20% increase in wages and salaries and the government says, oh, we can't afford that, we'll pay 5%. But that is, but not to get anything uh, to, to the sugar workers, that's unacceptable. That's an initial view, to having just scanned the report. Secondly, they, they said, that Mr. Holder said something that I totally disagree with that will come out in the debates. He said when they installed the interim management committee, they interim management committee found that the morale of the staff was low and that there were lots of problems about political interference and all. I can't even remember what he said that the interim management committee told him. What we found interesting is that the, the two persons who had Gaisuko now Mr. Paul Bim and Errol Hanuman, that, who were part of the interim management committee, they were the head of the company at the technical level from, I think, 2009 to 2014. Mm -hmm. Rad Singh only came in in 2014, or was it 2013? 2013. Somewhere around 2013. that, 2013. But for most of the years, in the last 10 years, the two of them had managed Gaisuko. And they're speaking about low morale and debts. I remember Paul Bim himself coming to my office when he was heading the company, arguing, they were saying that they need uh, injection because they couldn't pay their, bi uh, their, their bills, basically. And making it look like the recom these two persons or the interim management committee place, place all the blame on what happened in the last year, that suddenly political interference in one year, etc. That was the downfall of the industry. So we will have to challenge a lot of those things that the minister said in his statement. And then the privatization, my position on privatization prior to so even the Commission of Inquiry is that this is a, a sector that has a major systemic impact. There are few sectors in the country that have a system-wide impact, not just for people who are involved in that sector, but for the whole country because of their weight in that sector's weight in gross domestic product, in foreign currency earning, in employment, in so many other things. For example, Gaisuko, if Gaisuko was not there, the entire drainage system along the East Coast and many parts of the country, the maintenance costs will have to come to the government to drain those lands. It will be a huge bill to do that. Gaisuko provides a service to the villages sometimes that is not quantified. So if we transfer Gaisuko into private hands and after one year they, they don't make any money and they shut down because private people will shut it down. They're not the 